3. Office of Strategic Services Although various defense and civilian departments and agencies of the federal government maintained units for intelligence purposes during World War II, it was during this period of international tumult that the first centralized intelligence structure came into existence. The man proposing the new intelligence entity was William J. Donovan, a much-decorated hero of World War I, an attorney, a Republican, an internationalist, and an ardent foe of totalitarianism. Quote, President Roosevelt welcomed the suggestion of a single agency which would serve as a clearinghouse for all intelligence, as well as an organ of counter-propaganda and a training center for what were euphemistically called special operations, and invited Colonel Donovan to be its head. At first, Donovan was reluctant. His World War I antipathy to desk generalship was still strong, and though he was now 58, he preferred to lead a combat division. But the prospect of organizing a unified intelligence, sabotage, and subversive warfare unit, the first in American history, was most tempting. After a lengthy discussion with the president, he agreed to form the new agency, under the somewhat misleading title of Coordinator of Information. End quote. Footnote. Corey Ford. Donovan of OSS, Boston, Little Brown and Company, 1970, page 108. End footnote. Born in Buffalo, New York, on New Year's Day, 1883, William Joseph Donovan's paternal grandparents had emigrated to the United States from Ireland in about 1840. His father sold real estate at one time and later operated an insurance business. After attending St. Joseph's Collegiate Institute and Niagara University, B.A. 1905, William studied at Columbia University, L.L.B. 1907, and was admitted to the New York Bar in 1908. Four years later, he formed his first law partnership and began his military career, enlisting in the 1st Cavalry of the New York National Guard. He saw nine months of active duty along the Rio Grande during the Mexican campaign in 1916. When the United States entered the European hostilities the following year, Donovan was assistant chief of staff of the 27th Division of the New York National Guard. With the formation of the 42nd Rainbow Division, he was assigned to the 165th Infantry and subsequently became a colonel with the Fighting 69th Regiment. Wounded three times during 21 months of active service overseas, Donovan became one of the most decorated soldiers of the Great War. His own government awarded him the Congressional Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, and the Distinguished Service Medal. He was the only member of the armed forces to receive these three cherished decorations during World War I. In the summer of 1919, Returned to civilian life and about to resume his law practice in Buffalo, Donovan and his wife of five years left the United States on a long-deferred honeymoon to Japan. It was then that he began his intelligence activities. Quote, They had relaxed in Tokyo but a few days when the American ambassador, Roland Morris, called Donovan on urgent business. Morris was about to depart for Siberia to evaluate the reportedly unstable status of the white Russian government at Omsk, headed by Admiral Alexander Kolchak, and advised the State Department whether the Kolchak regime should be supported by the United States. He needed someone with Donovan's background and training to accompany him on his confidential mission. Ruth Donovan reconciled herself to what would become a pattern of similar missions over the next 40 years. End quote. A variety of other government positions soon beckoned Donovan. He became a U.S. attorney for the Western District of New York in 1922. Shortly thereafter, he served as a delegate to a Canadian-American Customs Conference held in Ottawa, which produced a treaty of cooperation in preventing international crimes. In 1924, Donovan was appointed Assistant Attorney General in charge of federal criminal matters. The following year, he became the assistant to Attorney General John G. Sargent, a position he held until 1929. Returning to New York, Donovan acted as counsel for the panel revising the state laws pertaining to the Public Service Commission. During the 1930s, 
he traveled to Ethiopia as an impartial observer of the invasion by Italy. Next, he was in Spain, scrutinizing the development of the civil war in that land. Through friends and contacts in Europe, he kept well informed on the progress of totalitarianism on the continent. With the outbreak of war in 1939, Donovan became a valuable operative for neutral America. In July 1940, he went to Great Britain to observe the Blitz for Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox. Upon his return, he made a vigorous effort to publicize England's ability to survive the German assault and to secure aid for the embattled British. In December, he was again on a reconnaissance mission, touring Gibraltar, Malta, Egypt, Greece, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Turkey, Cyprus, Palestine, Spain, Portugal, and again to Great Britain. With his observations on the military, political, and economic conditions in these nations, he also offered the suggestion for creating a central intelligence agency. The impetus for such an organization derived not only from felt need for such an entity at the federal level, but also from a close familiarity with the special operations structure of the British government. Once the American counterpart to the British Intelligence Office was established, Donovan became its chief, but served from the fall of 1941 to the spring of 1943 without a government salary or an active duty military rank. In the summer of 1941, four months before the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt issued a directive designating a coordinator of information, which said, quote, By virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States, and as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, it is ordered as follows. 1. There is hereby established the position of Coordinator of Information, with authority to collect and analyze all information and data which may bear upon national security, to correlate such information and data, and to make such information and data available to the President and to such departments and officials of the government as the President may determine and to carry out, when requested by the President, such supplementary activities as may facilitate the securing of information important for national security not now available to the government. 2. The several departments and agencies of the government shall make available to the Coordinator of Information all and any such information and data relating to national security as the Coordinator, with the approval of the President, may from time to time request. 3. The Coordinator of Information may appoint such committees, consisting of appropriate representatives of the various departments and agencies of the government, as he may deem necessary to assist him in the performance of his functions. 4. Nothing in the duties and responsibilities of the Coordinator of Information shall in any way interfere with or impair the duties and responsibilities of the regular military and naval advisors of the President as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. 5. Within the limits of such funds as may be allocated to the Coordinator of Information by the President, the Coordinator may employ necessary personnel and make provision for the necessary supplies, facilities, and services. 6. William J. Donovan is hereby designated as Coordinator of Information. End quote. Dated July 11, 1941, this purposely vague directive provided Donovan with an intelligence function, which might include special actions requested by the President and a propaganda mission. After a year of operations, it was felt that the propaganda duties of the coordinator were inappropriate to his intelligence activities. Subsequently, on June 13, 1942, these propaganda responsibilities were transferred to the newly created Office of War Information, established within the Office for Emergency Management. By military order of the same date, the Coordinator's Office was renamed the Office of Strategic Services and placed under the jurisdiction of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Donovan's new charter said, quote, By virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, it is ordered as follows. 1. The Office of Coordinator of Information, established by order of July 11, 1941, exclusive of the foreign information activities transferred to the Office of War Information by Executive Order of June 13, 1942, shall hereafter be known as 
the Office of Strategic Services and is hereby transferred to the jurisdiction of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff. 2. The Office of Strategic Services shall perform the following duties. A. Collect and analyze such strategic information as may be required by the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff. B. Plan and operate such special services as may be directed by the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff. 3. At the head of the Office of Strategic Services shall be a Director of Strategic Services, who shall be appointed by the President and who shall perform his duties under the direction and supervision of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff. 4. William J. Donovan is hereby appointed as Director of Strategic Services. 5. The Order of July 11, 1941, is hereby revoked. End quote. Although this directive clarified the duties of Donovan's organization, it did not ensure the Gadfly Agency's operational status. Quote, Executive Order 9182, divesting Donovan of propaganda production responsibilities, had ensured, at least for the moment, the continuance of Donovan's controversial experiment in organized intelligence and paramilitary service. But the transfer of its jurisdiction from the President to the Joint Chiefs of Staff which Donovan had personally requested, posed even more critical problems. Now the struggling COI had a new supervisor as well as a new name, and its functions and the extent of its authority were entirely dependent upon the decision of the JCS. This meant that all funds to operate OSS must come from Congress, primarily the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, and its budget requests must first be submitted to and approved by the gimlet-eyed Bureau of the Budget. The immediate problem of maintaining OSS during the transition period was temporarily bridged by instructions from the JCS that it should carry on as usual, pending further study of its wartime functions. But Donovan and his top staff were keenly aware that OSS faced a critical struggle to convince the Joint Chiefs and other ranking officials of the government not only that OSS should be given adequate written authority and manpower and supplies, but in fact that it should exist at all. End quote. Preparing his own case, Donovan, with staff assistance, drafted and redrafted a proposed OSS directive establishing the agency's operational authority. He was adamant that OSS should never be absorbed by or subject to the control of any other government office or the armed forces. In brief, OSS would assist and serve all segments of the federal structure, but would be subservient to none. His painstaking effort completed, Donovan forwarded the model directive and an explanatory memorandum to the Joint Chiefs. His time was then consumed by preparations for Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, and the execution of this first assault against the totalitarian forces holding the old world captive. Among other triumphs deriving from the incursion, the, quote, pre-invasion charts and estimates, and the OSS pioneered technique of keeping commanders informed of conditions ashore up to the very moment of landing, had clearly demonstrated the new agency's value. But Donovan's draft directive, submitted to the JCS before Torch, was still being debated in committee hearings. Early in December, Donovan had an informal chat with his old friend Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy. Knox was surprised to learn that so long a period had elapsed without any formal or comprehensive instructions from the Joint Chiefs, and he took up the matter with President Roosevelt, who told General George C. Marshall, Chairman of the JCS, I wish you would give Bill Donovan a little elbow room to operate in. Shortly afterward, the Joint Chiefs appointed committees of high-ranking officers, including Admiral Frederick Horn and Generals Joseph T. McNarney and Albert Weidmer, to make a personal inspection of OSS and recommend what should be done. The committee promptly rendered reports, which were not made available to OSS, and on December 23, 1942, six months after it was created, the agency received its long-awaited directive, almost word for word, the draft which Donovan had prepared. In the field of intelligence, OSS was given the independent status which Donovan sought, 
climaxing the bitter feud with the rival service agencies. The Joint Psychological Warfare Board, on which OSS had a minority of members, was abolished by the JCS. Henceforth, OSS was the sole agency of the JCS authorized to operate in the fields of intelligence, sabotage, and counterespionage, to conduct guerrilla operations, and to direct resistance groups in all enemy-occupied or controlled territory. General Marshall stated in a personal letter to Colonel Donovan, written on the same day the directive was issued, I regret that, after voluntarily coming under the jurisdiction of the JCS, your organization has not had smoother sailing. Nevertheless, it has rendered invaluable service, particularly with reference to the North African campaign. I am hopeful that the new Office of Strategic Services Directive will eliminate most, if not all, of your difficulties. End quote. Donovan's original idea for a centralized intelligence agency had derived from his exposure to the British intelligence structure during his 1940 observation missions. Faced with the necessity of quickly organizing an effective intelligence operation for the United States, Donovan again relied upon the British. Quote, William Stevenson had developed an undercover organization in the United States called British Security Coordinator, BSC, which was staffed with experienced officers, and they supplied the pioneer American agency at the outset with much of its secret intelligence. Experts in counterespionage and subversive propaganda and special operations were put at Donovan's disposal, and he was shown their methods of communicating with resistance forces behind the lines. In the early days, COI agents were trained at a school near Toronto, Canada, later a model for some of the training schools of OSS. Donovan said after the war, Bill Stevenson and the British Intelligence Service gave us an enormous head start which we could not otherwise have had. End quote. With information and expertise being supplied by the British, the next task involved structuring the new intelligence entity. Quote, Colonel Donovan brought a trained legal mind to the task of organizing his fast-growing agency. OSS was to employ some 30,000 people by the war's end and set it up as he would prepare a trial case with research experts to analyze the evidence and skilled assistants to conduct the prosecution. At the top of the chart were Donovan as director and G. Edward Buxton as assistant director, and beside them were the planning group, and the planning staff. Under Donovan were his three deputy directors with staff but not command status who were charged with the duty of coordinating the three main OSS functions, intelligence, research and analysis, secret intelligence, counterespionage, and collateral offices, operations, sabotage, guerrilla warfare, psychological warfare and related activities, and schools and training. A chief of services supervised the work of the offices of budget, procurement, finance, and related problems. In addition, there were some 18 essential offices which could not be assigned effectively to any subordinate command. Thus, the security office reported directly to Donovan, since security involved all procedures and all personnel regardless of rank. Other offices which served the entire organization were also placed under the director, including medical services, special funds, field photographic, communications, Navy and Army commands which handled the administrative problems of OSS naval and military personnel, and a liaison office to maintain relations with other government agencies. The functions of the principal branches were, quote, Research and Analysis, R&A, to produce the economic, military, social, and political studies and estimates for every strategic area from Europe to the Far East. Secret Intelligence, SI, to gather on-the-spot information from within neutral and enemy territory. Special Operations, SO, to conduct sabotage and work with resistance forces. Counterespionage, X2, to protect our own and allied intelligence operations and to identify enemy agents overseas. Morale Operations, MO, to create and disseminate black, covert propaganda. Operational Groups, OG, 
to train and supply and lead guerrilla forces in enemy territory. Maritime Unit, MU, to conduct maritime sabotage. Schools and Training, s &T, in overall charge of the assessment and training of personnel both in the United States and overseas. End quote. Not only did this departmentalization increase the agency's effectiveness, but it helped to maintain security. Each branch of OSS had its own secret file of information, which was available to members of other branches only on an official need-to-know basis. Donovan himself was not told the real names of some of his most successful agents, nor did he seek to learn them. Complete anonymity was the best safeguard against detection by the enemy. With the establishment of the Office of Coordinator of Information, a recruitment of new faces into the intelligence system was inaugurated. Most would continue their service with OSS until the end of the war. Quote, Heading Donovan's early staff was Colonel Edward Buxton, a close friend since World War I days, who left his business in Rhode Island to become the assistant director of the COI. James Murphy, formerly Donovan's secretary when he was assistant attorney general, was made his personal assistant. Dr. William L. Langer, distinguished Coolidge professor of history at Harvard, who had seen action as a sergeant in the Argonne and at Saint-Michel, headed the key research and analysis division, following the resignation of Dr. James Finney Baxter, president of Williams College and a brilliant administrator, who served briefly as the first chief of R&A. Dr. Edward S. Mason, later director of Harvard's School of Public Administration and a prominent economist, Dean Calvin Hoover of Duke University, and the late Dr. Edward Meade of Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, and Dr. Henry Field, curator of physical anthropology at Chicago's Field Museum, joined Donovan's expanding unit. David K. E. Bruce, later to be named U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James's, came to Washington to head COI's Special Activities Bruce, SAB, the agency's secret intelligence branch, and M.P. Goodfellow left his newspaper business to head the sabotage branch, Special Activities Goodfellow, or SAG. Both of these branches existed in the training stages only, since the U.S. was not yet at war. Robert E. Sherwood, noted American playwright and an intimate of President Roosevelt, assumed responsibility for the Foreign Information Service, FIS, end quote. When OSS was created, Sherwood became Director of Overseas Operations at the Office of War Information. Most of the personnel staying with OSS donned uniforms and held some type of rank in the armed forces. Nevertheless, they took their direction from Donovan and were not subjected to the command of the Army and Navy. Quote, from the beginnings of COI before Pearl Harbor to the termination of OSS after VJ Day, the research and analysis branch was the very core of the agency. The cloak and dagger exploits of agents infiltrated behind the lines captured the public imagination. But the prosaic and colorless grubbing of Dr. Langer's scientists, largely overlooked by the press, provided far and away the greater contribution to America's wartime intelligence. From the files of foreign newspapers, from obscure technical journals, from reports of international business firms and labor organizations, they extracted pertinent figures and data. With infinite patience, they fitted the facts together into a mosaic of information, the raw material of strategy, Donovan called it, on which the president and his chiefs of staff could form their operational decisions. End quote. Footnote. Popular accounts of OSS cloak and dagger activities, which were often heroic and valiant efforts, may be found in Stuart Alsop and Thomas Braden, Sub Rosa, The OSS and American Espionage, New York, Raynall and Hitchcock, 1946, and Corey Ford and Alistair McBain, Cloak and Dagger, The Secret Story of OSS, New York, Random House, 1946. An excellent account of OSS field operations may be found in R. Harris Smith, OSS, The Secret History of America's First Central Intelligence Agency, Berkeley, University of California Press, 1972. 
End footnote. The R&A branch gained sufficient prestige that other federal agencies sought its assistance. The Board of Economic Warfare, for example, asked RNA to determine if Soviet requests for American goods under Lend-Lease were justified by the conditions of their economy. On this particular matter, OSS findings proved to be more accurate than those of British intelligence. Footnote. See Ford, page 152. For an appreciation of the general approach of R&A to intelligence analysis, see Sherman Kent, Strategic Intelligence for American World Policy, Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1949. End footnote. Quote, At the start, Donovan established an R&A board of analysts, consisting of half a dozen scholars, each of whom took charge of some major activity and played an important role in recruiting further staff members. In this way, he was able to secure the high classifications needed to get the very best people for a general directorate. Subsequently, this board of analysts provided the model for the CIA Board of National Estimates, set up in 1950 by Dr. Langer for General Bedell Smith. Due to its many-sided and brilliant staff, R&A was credited with producing the most accurate estimates made by the Allies in World War II. End quote. In addition to its research and analysis achievements, OSS was to prove inventive and innovative in another capacity. These were the products of the Research and Development Unit, R&D, headed by Stanley Lovell. Quote, Dr. Stanley Lovell, in charge of the agency's calculated mischief, was a sunny little nihilist, his spectacles twinkling and his chubby face creasing with merriment as he displayed his latest diabolical devices. This simple candle could be placed by a female agent in the bedroom of an amorous German officer, Lovell chuckled, and would burn perfectly until the flame touched the high explosive contained in the lower half of the candle. This innocent-looking plastic cylinder, called the Firefly, dropped furtively into the tank of a car by a Maquis filling station attendant, would explode after the gasoline had swelled a rubber retaining ring. If the vehicle were a German tank, Lovell had to pause to wipe his spectacles and dab the tears of laughter from his eyes, the occupants would be cremated before they could open the escape hatch. This anerometer, a barometric fuse attached to a length of hose packed with explosive, could be slid into the rear of the fuselage of an enemy aircraft at 5,000 feet altitude, he explained gleefully, the entire tail section would blow off. This limpet, fastened by a powerful magnet to the side of a ship below waterline, would detonate when the magnesium alloy was eroded by salt water, long after the saboteur had left the area. It was used effectively by the Norwegian underground to sink Nazi troop ships in the narrow fjords of Oslo and Narvik. Lovell doubled up and slapped his knees at the thought and sent untold thousands of German soldiers to a watery grave. End quote. Footnote. R&D also produced, or at least considered, a number of bizarre and totally impractical schemes and devices. See Stanley P. Lovell of Spies and Stratagems, Inglewood Cliffs, Prentice Hall, 1963. End footnote. In spite of the various intelligence accomplishments of OSS, not everyone in Washington was happy about the creation and existence of Donovan's organization. Quote, J. Edgar Hoover, perhaps fearing that COI would steal the spotlight long enjoyed by his FBI, was not satisfied until he had Roosevelt's word that Donovan would be expressly forbidden to conduct any espionage activities within the United States. Nelson Rockefeller, chairman of the State Department's Committee to Coordinate Inter-American Affairs, once called, even more pretentiously, the Committee on Cultural and Commercial Relations between North and South America, echoed the FBI in seeking assurance that Donovan would likewise be excluded from his established bailiwick in the Southern Hemisphere. Major General George V. Strong, later chief of Army G-2, could not understand that G-2 represented tactical military intelligence and COI strategic intelligence of all kinds, 
and Strong therefore felt there was a definite conflict of interests. He vigorously fought Roosevelt's proposal that Colonel Donovan should be returned to active duty with the rank of Major General, a grade more commensurate with his new duties, and offered the irrelevant argument that Wild Bill was too independent to be a team player. If there's a loose football on the field, Strong protested, he'll pick it up and run with it. Isolationist senators such as Burton Wheeler and Robert Taft likewise opposed Donovan's advance in rank, and Taft rose on the Senate floor to warn his colleagues of the danger of White House control of intelligence and investigative units. Realizing that the suggested promotion might cause a prolonged congressional fight, Roosevelt yielded, at least for the moment, and Donovan took over as head of COI in a civilian capacity. End quote. Though the president granted the FBI exclusive intelligence jurisdiction over South and Latin America, OSS still made forays into the region. The rivalry between the two agencies also exemplified itself in other ways. Quote, in January 1942, Donovan's officers secretly penetrated the Spanish embassy in Washington and began photographing the code books and other official documents of Franco's pro-Axis government. Hoover learned of this operation and was angered because the COI men were invading his operational territory. The FBI did not bother to register a formal protest. While the COI officers were making one of their nocturnal entries into the embassy in April, two FBI squad cars followed. When Donovan's men were in the building, the cars pulled up outside the embassy and turned on their sirens. The entire neighborhood was awakened, and the COI interlopers were sent scurrying. Donovan protested this incredible FBI action to the White House. Instead of reprimanding Hoover, Roosevelt's aides ordered the embassy infiltration project turned over to the Bureau. End quote. OSS was also restricted from entering the Pacific Theater, but not Asia, by General Douglas MacArthur. The agency's intelligence materials were utilized by MacArthur in his invasion of and return to the Philippines. Admiral Chester Nimitz had a small OSS maritime unit for underwater demolition action with his fleet and another OSS force delivered special weapons to the 10th Army for the Okinawa landing. But Donovan's agents were otherwise unauthorized to operate in MacArthur's command area. Quote, General MacArthur's intransigence is difficult to explain. His personal relationship with Donovan was cordial. They had served together in the Rainbow Division during the First World War, and both were highly decorated heroes. Donovan entertained the deepest regard for MacArthur's brilliance as a military strategist and never offered any reason for his adamant opposition to OSS. But members of the agency had their private theories. Some speculated that Charles Willoughby, MacArthur's intelligence chief, anxious to ensure full credit for his intelligence unit, feared that Wild Bill would grab the spotlight. Others held that MacArthur, a West Pointer and firm believer in the chain of command, objected to the presence of a uniformed civilian acting independently in his theater. A few intimates, who knew Donovan's own determination, suspected that it was the inevitable clash between two strong personalities, equally fixed in purpose. End quote. Footnote. As commander of United Nations troops in Korea in 1951, MacArthur also refused to allow the Central Intelligence Agency to operate in his theater. End footnote. In spite of these jurisdictional limitations placed on OSS by the FBI and the Army, the agency gathered its intelligence materials from all over the globe by whatever means available. Agreements were negotiated regarding special operations by OSS at the outset of efforts to liberate Europe, beginning with the North African invasion. Quote, in planning the invasion, political problems posed themselves immediately. Roosevelt secured Churchill's agreement that the landings, codenamed Torch, should be a predominantly American operation, with the United States handling the diplomatic aspects. The president and his advisors believed that anglophobic French commanders in North Africa would offer less resistance to a landing led by American troops with British forces remaining in the background. 
At the Secret Service level, a similar agreement had been reached in June 1942 as part of a comprehensive operational accord with the British SOE, Special Operations Executive, negotiated in London by OSS Colonels Preston Goodfellow and Garland Williams, an official of the New York Narcotics Commission. In the first of several wartime delineations of spheres of influence for clandestine activity, OSS took primary responsibility for subversion in North Africa, as well as China, Korea, the South Pacific, and Finland. The British, in turn, assumed temporary predominance in India, West Africa, the Balkans, and the Middle East. Western Europe was considered joint territory. End quote. Such agreements, of course, were of momentary importance and required renegotiations as new areas came under liberation and whenever the grand strategists shift their attack objectives and designs for routing the enemy. In the midst of such planning, old jealousies and new antagonism flared against OSS. Quote, Back in the early days of COI, London had been most cooperative, sharing its training facilities and operational techniques with the struggling new agency. As OSS grew stronger, however, SIS, the British Secret Intelligence Service, showed an increasing reluctance to accept its American counterpart as a full and equal partner. Britain's position was enhanced by the theater command's lack of sympathy with OSS objectives. Throughout 1942 and 43, the practice of European theater of operations was to rely mainly on British intelligence and ignore OSS offers of assistance, thus inadvertently aiding SIS efforts to subordinate the younger American organization. The U.S. Theater of Command staff based their policy on Britain's greater experience in the field, but they overlooked the fact that OSS could provide new and different information to supplement or even refute the intelligence from other sources, and would serve long-range U.S. strategic needs best if it remained independent. The issue came to a head in September of 1943 when ETO USA refused to give OSS authority to conduct espionage on the European continent unless it operated under British supervision. General Donovan insisted that freedom from the knowledge and influence of any outside power was essential to the success of his secret intelligence branch, and he strongly opposed the SIS efforts to force an amalgamation. In an appeal to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he pointed out that Britain's proposal suggests coordination and agreement, but as employed here, the word coordination means control and agreement means dependence. This attempt of the British, by reason of their physical control of territory and communication, to subordinate the American intelligence and counterintelligence service is short-sighted and dangerous to the ultimate interests of both countries. End quote. As a result of his arguments, a new JCS directive on October 27, 1943, gave OSS full and unqualified authority to operate on the continent. ETO USA accordingly reversed its position, and the independence of American long-range espionage was assured. Rather than engage in destructive competition, the British yielded. OSS Special Operations, SO, and Counterintelligence, X2, greatly strengthened their ETO and were given access to the extensive files which Britain had taken decades to develop. In turn, OSS provided funds, manpower, resistance supplies, three subchasers for Norwegian operations, and a squadron of Liberator bombers for airdrops to occupied countries. Thenceforth, throughout the war, American and British intelligence worked in productive, though discreet, partnership. On occasion, unusual organization schemes facilitated Donovan's efforts at maintaining an effective intelligence operation. Early in the war, influential German emigres to the United States were recruited by Shortwave Research, Inc., a COI front, to broadcast anti-Nazi messages to their homeland. To retain an OSS foothold in China, Donovan found it necessary to agree to creating the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, 
headed by Chiang Kai-shek's feared and hated secret police chief, Tai Li, described by one OSS report as, quote, not the Admiral Canaris of China, but the Heinrich Himmler, end quote. The deputy director of the unit was Captain Milton Mary Miles, who, while chief of OSS Far Eastern Operations and commander of Navy Group China, had befriended Tai Li. The scheme was harshly criticized by the theater commander, General Joseph Stilwell, and his highly experienced State Department political advisors, John Patton Davies, Jr., and John Service. The new organization soon began to disintegrate. Miles became hostile toward OSS headquarters and autocratic in terms of controlling OSS field operations in China. Eventually, Donovan personally intervened, fired Miles, and challenged Tai Li to try and halt OSS agents operating in his country. Donovan also enlisted the help of General Claire Chenault in establishing independence for OSS operations in China and championing the agency's activities. And in the middle of neutral Switzerland, attached to the American legation at Bern as a special assistant to the minister, was Alan Dulles, an OSS master agent literally surrounded by the Nazi regime. Dispatched in November 1942, Dulles was instrumental in intelligence gathering and directing special operations within enemy territory. From February to May 1945, he served as the negotiator and conciliator in efforts which led to the unconditional surrender of close to a million men occupying northern Italy and the termination of hostilities on that front. Footnote. See Ford, pages 291 through 295. Also see Alan Dulles, The Secret Surrender, New York, Harper and Row, 1966. End footnote. In the autumn of 1944, as Allied troops continued to roll across Europe and press closer to Japan in the Pacific, President Roosevelt sought Donovan's thinking on the matter of a permanent intelligence operation for the period after the end of the war. In response to the chief executive's request, Donovan offered the following classified memorandum. Quote, November 18, 1944. Pursuant to your note of 31st October, 1944, I have given consideration to the organization of an intelligence service for the post-war period. In the early days of the war, when the demands upon intelligence services were mainly in and for military operations, the OSS was placed under the direction of the JCS. Once our enemies are defeated, the demand will be equally pressing for information that will aid us in solving the problems of peace. This will require two things. One, that intelligence control be returned to the supervision of the president. Two, the establishment of a central authority reporting directly to you, with responsibility to frame intelligence objectives and to collect and coordinate the intelligence material required by the executive branch in planning and carrying out national policy and strategy. I attach in the form of a draft directive, tab A, the means by which I think this could be realized without difficulty or loss of time. You will note that coordination and centralization are placed at the policy level, but operational intelligence, that pertaining primarily to department action, remains within the existing agencies concerned. The creation of a central authority thus would not conflict with or limit necessary intelligence functions within the Army, Navy, Department of State, and other agencies. In accordance with your wish, this is set up as a permanent long-range plan. But you may want to consider whether this, or part of it, should be done now by executive or legislative action. There are common-sense reasons why you may desire to lay the keel of the ship at once. The immediate revision and coordination of our present intelligence system would affect substantial economies and aid in the more efficient and speedy termination of the war. Information important to the national defense, being gathered now by certain departments and agencies, is not being used to full advantage in the war. Coordination at the strategy level would prevent waste, and avoid the present confusion that leads to waste and unnecessary duplication. Though in the midst of war, we are also in a period of transition, which, before we are aware, 
will take us into the tumult of rehabilitation. An adequate and orderly intelligence system will contribute to informed decisions. We have now in the government the trained and specialized personnel needed for the task. This talent should not be dispersed. William J. Donovan, Director. Tab A. Substantive Authority Necessary in Establishment of a Central Intelligence Service. In order to coordinate and centralize the policies and actions of the government relating to intelligence, one, there is established in the Executive Office of the President a Central Intelligence Service to be known as the blank, at the head of which shall be a director appointed by the President. The director shall discharge and perform his functions and duties under the direction and supervision of the President. Subject to the approval of the President, the director may exercise his powers, authorities, and duties through such officials or agencies in such manner as he may determine. 2. There is established in the blank an advisory board consisting of the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, and such other members as the President may subsequently appoint. The board shall advise and assist the director with respect to the formulation of basic policies and plans of the blank. 3. Subject to the direction and control of the President, and with any necessary advice and assistance from the other departments and agencies of the government, the blank shall perform the following functions and duties. A. Coordination of the functions of all intelligence agencies of the government and the establishment of such policies and objectives as will assure the integration of national intelligence efforts. b. Collection, either directly or through existing government departments and agencies, of pertinent information, including military, economic, political, and scientific, concerning the capabilities, intentions, and activities of foreign nations, with particular reference to the effect such matters may have upon the national security, policies, and interests of the United States. c. Final evaluation, synthesis, and dissemination within the government of the intelligence required to enable the government to determine policies with respect to national planning and security in peace and war and the advancement of broad national policy. d. Procurement, training, and supervision of its intelligence personnel. e. Subversive operations abroad. f. Determination of policies for a coordination of facilities essential to the collection of information under subparagraph B hereof, and G, such other functions and duties relating to intelligence as the President from time to time may direct. 4. The blank shall have no police or law enforcement functions, either at home or abroad. 5. Subject to paragraph 3 hereof, Existing intelligence agencies within the government shall collect, evaluate, synthesize, and disseminate departmental operating intelligence, herein defined as intelligence required by such agencies in the actual performance of their functions and duties. 6. The director shall be authorized to call upon departments and agencies of the government to furnish appropriate specialists for such supervisory and functional positions within the blank as may be required. 7. All government departments and agencies shall make available to the Director such intelligence material as the Director, with the approval of the President, from time to time may request. 8. The blank shall operate under an independent budget. 9. In time of war or unlimited national emergency, all programs of the blank in areas of actual or projected military operations shall be coordinated with military plans and shall be subject to the approval of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Parts of such programs which are to be executed in a theater of military operations shall be subject to the control of the theater commander. 10. Within the limits of such funds as may be available to the blank, the director may employ necessary personnel and make provision for necessary supplies facilities, and services. The director shall be assigned, upon the approval of the President, such military and naval personnel as may be required in the performance of the functions and duties of the blank.
The director may provide for the internal organization and management of the blank in such manner as he may determine. End quote. Three months later, on February 9, 1945, the isolationist press triumvirate, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Daily News, and the Washington Times Herald carried an article by Walter Trohan characterizing the proposed agency as an, quote, all powerful intelligence service to spy on the post war world, end quote, and one which, quote, would supersede all existing federal police and intelligence units. End quote. The column continued with full quotations from the memorandum and draft directive prepared by Donovan. The effect of the story was to raise a multiplicity of fears about such an entity being established and to also unleash a profusion of jealousies among the existing federal intelligence and investigative units. The source of the leak regarding Donovan's communique to the president was thought to be FBI Director Hoover. A second blow was delivered to OSS in April when the man who had urged its creation and had remained appreciative of its mission vis-à-vis -vis the other intelligence functionaries died suddenly in Warm Springs, Georgia. In many ways, the war, due to end in four months, claimed one more fatality in the case of Franklin D. Roosevelt. But it also seized a president who understood and championed the unique intelligence activities of OSS. The new chief executive would be far less appreciative. Quote, It must be conceded, in fairness to Harry Truman, that he had never been taken into the full confidence of President Roosevelt. Their relationship was less than full or intimate, and deliberately or due to carelessness, he had failed to brief his vice president on the dangers of an intelligence gap in the dawning atomic age. Whether it would have saved Donovan's plan for a centralized and independent post-war intelligence service is questionable. Truman was a practical politician, and he saw OSS as a political liability because it gave the opposition, both extreme right and extreme left, a chance to attack the administration. The cry was on to cut the military expenditure, to disarm, to bring the boys home. Roosevelt might have refused to yield to public pressure, but Truman could not count on the same support of the American people. End quote. Without consulting Donovan or the Joint Chiefs of Staff, President Truman, on September 20th, directed that OSS terminate operations, effective October 1st, 1945. The Bureau of the Budget, prompted by Secretary of State James F. Burns, insisted on relocating the R&A section of OSS within the State Department to facilitate research needs there. Quote, At Secretary Burns's request, Dr. Langer came to state in 1946 for six months to set up the intelligence unit, but the regional desks were not particularly interested at the time. End quote. Established as the Interim Research and Intelligence Branch, the unit became the Office of Intelligence Research in 1947 and the Bureau of Intelligence and Research a decade later. The Secret Intelligence, SI, and Counterespionage, X2, sections were transferred to the War Department, where they formed the Strategic Services Unit, which, in one expert's view, quote, was nothing more than a caretaker body formed to preside over the liquidation of the OSS espionage network, end quote. Quote, only after the integrated mechanism of OSS had been scrapped and the majority of its trained personnel, who would have liked to continue, had drifted away in disgust, did the truth dawn on Truman that he was no longer able to obtain overseas information of the type available during World War II. As General Donovan had predicted, a critical intelligence gap had developed, leaving the United States far behind the other major powers. So urgent was the need for knowledge that in January 1946, at far greater expense and effort than would have been necessary if Donovan's advice had been followed, Truman set up an intermediate national intelligence authority, made up of the secretaries of state, war, and navy, and the chief of staff to the president. Under this agency was a so-called Central Intelligence Group, CIG, headed by Rear Admiral Sidney Sowers, an acquaintance of Truman's from Missouri, 
whose intelligence background consisted of a tour as deputy director of ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, and who is said to have been instrumental in persuading Truman to set up the NIA and the CIG. He was to be succeeded less than six months later by Lieutenant General Hoyt Vandenberg, a capable Air Force strategist, but equally lacking in intelligence experience, who in less than a year returned to the Air Force. End quote. While one authority credits OSS with a wartime budget of $135 million, another expert source has written, quote, from 1942 through 1945, excluding the salaries of members of the armed forces on active duty with the agency and a substantial part of overseas logistics support, the cost of OSS averaged less than $37 million a year, end quote. While much of the agency's money was provided in unvouchered funds, there was apparently close accounting of its expenditure. Quote, Donovan was the first man to whom Congress made a grant of $25 million without requiring an accounting, Dr. Langer notes. I recall the morning when the general announced this at a staff meeting and at once turned a cold douche on our relation. This does not mean, he said, that a single dollar is going to be spent irresponsibly, because I know when the war is over, this agency will be in a very exposed position unless its record is spotless. For this reason, I have asked one of the leading New York accountants to join the OSS, and he will see to it that all expenditures are accounted for to me, even though I am under no such obligation to the Congress. End quote. However, the vigilant bookkeeping applied to OSS expenditures does not seem to have extended to the maintenance of its membership list. Quote, no one can even guess the actual size of OSS at its wartime peak. Over 30,000 names were listed on the agency's roster. But there were countless partisan workers in the occupied countries whose identities were never known, who were paid OSS money and armed with OSS weapons and performed OSS missions, yet for the most part, were unaware that their direction came from Washington. Each field agent employed several local sub-agents, and they in turn recruited anonymous friends from the surrounding countryside, sometimes numbering in the thousands. One lone parachutist, Ernst Floch of Chicago, who dropped into the Herricourt district of France, wound up the war in command of an underground force of 3,500. Another French-American agent named Duval organized and personally led an estimated 7,000 resistance fighters in the Lyon area. Altogether, the Maquis in France, the Kachin tribesmen in Burma, formed a worldwide shadow army which served under OSS in close support of the Allied military effort, and which faded back into obscurity when the fighting ceased. End quote. Once he left the directorship of OSS, Donovan also began fading back into obscurity. In the years immediately after the war, he devoted much of his time to the cause of European federalism as chairman of the American Committee on United Europe. He was also a strong advocate for wrestling the initiative from the USSR in the so-called Cold War. After serving as ambassador to Thailand during 1953 and 1954, he worked as national chairman of the International Rescue Committee to assist refugees coming from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And later, in 1956, he organized a campaign to raise a million dollars for Hungarian refugee relief. Never again was he called into service as an intelligence leader. Speculation ran high in 1947 with the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency that Donovan would be selected to direct the new organization. But the position went to Rear Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencoder, the last head of the Central Intelligence Group. And again, in 1953, when President Eisenhower was searching for a new CIA director to replace the departing Bedell Smith, Donovan's name was prominent among the candidates. But once again, and for the final time, the call went to someone else. On this occasion, to his old friend and OSS colleague, Alan Dulles. Six years later, on February 8, 1959, William J. Donovan died in the nation's capital. This is Our Hidden History.